Here is Himit Mehta. All right, can you all hear me? Yeah. All right, if you're in the back and you can't, just like wave and I'll get louder. That's perfect. Um, so I don't, it's weird. I don't have a presentation on the computer, which is weird for me. But I want to talk to all of you about Jesus. <laughs> here's, here's the question I want you to think about. Why are people still religious? Because I'm assuming most of us here went through some transition period at some point where we shed our faith, we're no longer religious. But when you think about it, how many books are out there now trying to convince you not to believe in God? How many websites? How many YouTube channels? All this information that for most of us, I'm 32, when I was in high school, none of this stuff was around, right? And so for most of you, I'm assuming, when you were growing up, maybe if you became an atheist when you were younger, there, these books weren't there. And when you realized you didn't believe in this stuff, it's kind of an epiphany. And now these spoiled little kids have all these things. <laughs> they have all this stuff. There are books everywhere. You don't even need to hide the books from your parents. You could just clear your browser history. And yet people are still religious. Why? I mean, if it was simply a matter of having a logical argument for why they shouldn't be religious, religion would be done by now. But it's not. <laughs> and if it was a matter of just getting this information to people, you would think more people would have left the church. But here's the thing. We've all seen these statistics that say the number of people who are not religious is on the rise, right? Like, what is it? Like, 30% of people under the age of 30 have no religious affiliation. But what percentage are atheists? It's really small. Like the bulk of that percentage are people who are like, eh, I believe in something. I believe in a higher power. I don't call myself a Christian. I mean, that, that, the nuns, that 30%, that includes people who say, I follow Jesus, but I'm not a Christian. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a lot of people in our ranks who still go to church on a regular basis. So my question to you is, why is that happening? And I'd like to propose an answer to that. They're going because there's something about church that is bringing them in. And I don't think it's the music. And I don't think, I don't think it's just the sermons. I don't even think it's because they believe everything the pastor says. Because how many Catholics do we know who go to Catholic church or send their kids to Catholic school the Catholic Church is opposed to abortion. They, they don't support that stuff. They're opposed to LGBT rights. And yet, most Catholics support those things. So why are they still part of this church? And again, I'm saying it's not because of any of those things. There's something about church and that religious community that draws them in. And we are doing a disservice if we say, hey, your pastor said this, and your pastor's wrong. And because I can show you that, you should stop going to church. I mean, we get that logic a lot. If a Christian apologist says this and we can debunk it, maybe they'll figure this out and then just stop taking those people seriously. But it doesn't really work like that. How many of you have heard of the Sunday Assembly or like the Atheist Church? Yeah, it's, it's a good program. I like the people that run it. I like the idea. And they kind of market themselves as, we provide people with the things that churches provide. We do everything that is good about church. We replicate it, except for the God stuff. And the way I heard uh, Sanderson Jones, who was one of the co-founders of it, put it, he said, you know, if you're walking and your shoe has a rock in it, that's annoying. Well, what do you do? You don't throw out your shoe. You take out the rock, you get rid of it, and you keep the shoe. And that's kind of the analogy for what they're trying to do with the atheist church. Right? It's replicating the good parts of church and getting rid of the God. And again, I want to say to you, I don't think God is what's keeping everyone in the church. Just because you have secular music or because you have inspiring sermons or you gather once a week as a group of atheists or once a month or for something like this maybe once a year, that's not why people are going. So what can we learn from Christians? I'm not even asking that sarcastically. What are churches doing right that we're not doing? 
and that we're hurting our own cause by not figuring out what that is. And maybe if we could figure that out, we could draw more of those people who are on the fence, who maybe still go to church even though they don't believe in any of this stuff, maybe we could draw them closer to our side. So let me give you a, a few ideas of what I think churches are doing right that I think we're missing out on, or at least we don't do as good of a job of it. So one thing is churches really give you a sense of purpose. Again, not sarcastic. They really give you a sense of purpose. Um, Thomas mentioned that I wrote this book, I Sold My Soul on eBay years ago. Long story short, I visited a whole bunch of Christian churches for the first time in my life. And it was written for a Christian publisher, by the way. They were like, we want Christians to know what church is like from an atheist perspective. And you know, I, even then, this was written about a decade ago, they said uh, all the studies seemed to say that young people were leaving church. Like even Christians saw the, the writing on the wall. And the publisher said, we want you to go to Michigan uh, because there's a church in Michigan that draws a lot of young people. And that's weird. <laughs> we want you to drive up to Grand Rapids and figure out what the hell are they doing there that is keeping young people in. And maybe, maybe because I'm an atheist and I'm younger, maybe there's something about it that appeals to me too. That's what they wanted to know. And honestly, I didn't know anything about the church. I had I didn't even know who the pastor was. His name was Rob Bell, um, and he's a famous name in like the Christian community. But I'd, I'd never really known anything about him. So I drove to their church uh, several hours, and I didn't. I had GPS, but like I didn't even find the church. There was no signs anywhere. Eventually, I found it because I just saw a horde of people walking into a building, and I'm like, I guess they look like they know where they're going. Um, and it was just a rundown mall. And there were no signs anywhere. You just had to know that's where the church was. It's like Fight Club or something. <laughs> they, they went in. The whole church, you know, we talk, you guys have seen these pictures of big mega churches that have seating like this and like this amazing stage. Their whole church was just an empty warehouse with like a podium in the middle. Because that's all they needed. Someone gets up there, they talk to the round, and that, that's kind of it. But again, that doesn't tell you why anyone's going there. But here's what they did. One of the assistant pastors gets up on stage when the sermon begins, and he says to this crowd, and the crowd, I'm telling you, it's like all high school students who came on their own. That's not usual. He gets up there, and he's like, how many of you saw our local paper this morning? And yeah, no one's raising their hand, because they don't read. And so he's like, did you guys see the front page, this article on the front page? It says, 25% of the people living in Grand Rapids are living below the poverty line. That's a horrible, horrible thing. What are we as a church going to do to fix that? And he said that completely seriously, and he wanted them to think about it. And you knew that after that sermon ended, they weren't going to stop talking about it because they were going to go back to their small groups later in the week and discuss it. Because this was a problem that affected their community and they had to solve it. And they were part of this group of people who wanted to get together and fix it. That's amazing. That's so cool that they would think about that stuff and that, like, yeah, they're just inspired by their faith to address a problem like that. Most churches don't do that, but the good ones do. And so, I mean, I was, I was there, I'm like, I want to know what they're going to do. I want to figure out how to be a part of that because that seems like a worthwhile thing to do. Every kid in that church felt like they were going to contribute to the solution. But I've been to a lot of atheist meetings. I've left most of them with nothing like that driving me to figure out what I'm going to do with my life next. Like, after you leave this conference, what are you going to take back with you? Is it that sense of purpose? How many of you run a meetup group or a local group or something like that? I would ask all of you who are leaders of that sort, when you have these meetings, what are you leaving people with? What are they going to do? And it's easy to make excuses, like we don't have the numbers that they do, we don't necessarily have the influence that they do, but man, if we're not even trying, we're not helping our own case. Um, like how could you not want to be a part of that? And by the way, think about it too. Most churches give you plenty of reason to, to have a purpose. They will send you on a mission trip. They will make sure you are teaching younger people uh, within the church. Like the young people teach Sunday school, but you feel important. And people are drawn to that. They feel important all the time. People will join like Mark Driscoll's church in Seattle, and that guy's horrible because they feel that sense of purpose. That's why they're drawn to it. 
And we are, we're really bad at that. It's not enough to just have weekly meetings where you can bash religion for a while and then go home. There's, I, don't, I can't do anything with that information. And this is a really hard thing to duplicate, by the way. So I work with a group called Foundation Beyond Belief. Um, spoiler, sponsor, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's an awesome group, and the, the reason it even started is we were asking ourselves, when there's a tragedy going on, something like Hurricane Katrina or something, religious groups are really good at raising money and sending money to help the people in need, but there was no atheist organization that could rally the troops in that way. And so what we did is basically we said, look, we will offer you several charities that are doing awesome, awesome things, and every three months, every quarter of the year, you could say, I want to give... Uh, we'll have a new slate for you, and every month you can say, I want to give $20 to this whole slate of charities, because they're awesome. And I want to give like 20% of my money here and 30% here, and you feel like you're helping these great groups. Um, and it's been working. We've raised, I think, a couple million dollars over the course of the years. And in addition, um, but that's not enough just to give money, because we also do volunteers on the ground. We have a whole volunteer component, so you're actually doing something uh, in person. We have a disaster relief, so that if a tsunami strikes, we can act quickly and mobilize people and give money to groups that are doing the good work that they need to do. None of them proselytize, so your money's going to a good place, but it's doing that. But let me tell you, so last year we had our first conference for Foundation Beyond Belief, and I'm telling you, it was the most inspirational thing I've ever been to. I heard people talking, no one talked about God. They were, they were all atheists, I think, but none of them talked about God. Like, one guy talked about how he took a trip to, like, India, and he saw kind of what Mother Teresa's group was doing there. Um, and there's some things they do good and a lot of things they do bad. And he's like, I think I can do what they're doing, and I can do it better, and I can do it without the Catholic influence. And that's what he did. He quit his job and just went. It's like, holy crap, that's amazing. And it, this whole conference was just full of it. And you felt inspired to do more after you left that conference. So this year, we were like, OK, we got to top that. We got to have a bigger, con we got to have a conference that really inspires people again. So we had the venue booked. We were like, what is a topic that needs critical thinking, that needs our humanist sort of love for each other and humanity? And we figured there is no cause more important right now than Black Lives Matter. That's, that's a good cause. And we had, we had awesome speakers who were going to talk about what the intersection is between our atheism and why you know, police officers or societies are really bad at applying critical thought to a certain segment of society. It was, we had great speakers. We had the venue lined up. And then we had to cancel the conference because no one signed up for it. And there's a lot of reasons that could happen. I realize that. Like, there's a, maybe it's the wrong day. Maybe people couldn't get to Boston, which is where we were holding it. But man, if we can't get people excited or interested about a cause like that, what good are we? What are we doing? Like, that's sad. And I promise you, if any church group put on an event like that, it would be packed. Because everything they do is packed. Because people want to be involved and they want to fix that. So we have to find a way to make people feel important, like they're part of something and give them a purpose. Uh, we don't do that as a whole. There are, of course, um, I'm sure there are groups here who can give you examples of things they're doing to fix that. But as a whole, we're not good at that. We like to come together, we like to laugh at religion, and then we leave. And like, for a lot of people, that, that kind of does it. It fills a need that we don't get other places. But it's not enough if you want to draw people who are on the fence to say, here's why you should leave your religion. You're basically telling them, you know how the church makes you feel really good and important? We got none of that. <laughs> Why would they come over? They wouldn't. Especially if they're on the fence and they're like, eh, I, why, should I, why should I go here? I, why would they? So here's another thing. Churches are really good at offering community. And we know that. And we have all tried to be parts of those communities, like uh, secular communities. So when I became an atheist, I was in high school. I was a freshman in high school. And like I said, there were no books or anything like that that I knew about anyway. And I didn't want my parents finding out. So I waited until like 10 o'clock at night when they were sleeping, my parents were sleeping, and I'd make sure they're not on the phone so I could log on to AOL. And then I could try to find like atheist chat rooms and man, that's shady. And so that's, 
but that was cool because I'm like, oh wow, I can bounce these ideas off of these people and they're telling me things and it makes sense and that's strange and awesome. Um, but it wasn't until college that I finally had an atheist group and I got to meet all these people. It was so neat. And anyone, how many of you are here, this is your first event like this? How cool is it that you're just surrounded by atheists who are like on the same wavelength as you? <laughs> that's, that's a really cool thing. Uh, if you ever, if anyone went to the Reason Rally in 2012, um, when there were thousands of people there, everyone I talked to who went there and that was their first thing that they did, it's like, oh my God, I'm not, I don't have to censor myself here. I can just, I can make friends who were not bound by God. Like that's, that's an amazing thing. Um, but for the most part, our communities are really makeshift. Uh, I worked with the Secular Student Alliance, volunteered with them for a lot of years. They're awesome. One of the biggest problems, uh, and I, I think I'm not revealing anything here, they will tell you this. One of the problems we had for many years is that you have a great college group that really does a lot of work, but then the leader graduates and the group dies. That happens everywhere, right? Like someone starts the group and then for whatever reason they move on to other things and then no one takes over. And I can tell you, the SSA fig realized this is the biggest problem we need to address. And they've put a lot of resources into making sure their attrition rate is low. In the sense that they ask you, like, wh whoever the president is, they ask you at the beginning of the year, who's your president next year? Because if you don't know, you better figure it out now. Because you've got to keep this going. Um, so those communities are important because you feel part of something a little bigger. And that's, that's an amazing thing. Um, I don't know if this is a tangent or not. But over the past year or so, I've been really fascinated by communities of people who are not ex-Christian or ex-Catholic or Protestant, whatever. They're like ex-Jehovah's Witnesses or ex-Mormons. And it's just fascinating because they're coming from a smaller group. And you wonder, like, what resources are there for them when they leave? Because there's every book like, written by famous atheists is about leaving, usually, uh, Christianity. So what resources are there for them? And this is a true story. I was, I was somewhere like a month ago. I ran into a group of ex-Mormons, which is like, for me, finding candy. This is great. <laughs> ran into a group of ex-Mormons, and we all went out to lunch. And I'm like, how do you all know each other? How did you meet? And they all pointed to one guy. I'm like, who is this guy? He's just an ex-Mormon. But for a long time, he had a podcast. Uh, John DeLynn is his name. He has a great podcast about Mormonism. And for a long time, he was critical of the church within the church. He's saying, we should ordain women as part of the Mormon faith. We should accept LGBT people. Um, and then finally, the church had to make a decision because this guy was getting really popular. Do you allow him to stay in the church and say these things, or do you kick him out? And at the same time, there was another woman, uh, Kate Kelly, I believe, who was really fighting for, uh, her group is called Ordain Women trying to get the church to fix itself on this. And they had to make that decision with her too. And eventually, the New York Times covered this story. Earlier this year, the Mormon church decided, kick him out. So now he's doing the same podcast, but now he's on the outside. And what's amazing though, is I have met ex-Mormons at random places anywhere. And I will just ask them, have you heard of John DeLynn? And they're all like, yes, I love that guy. Because they all, like gravitate toward this one dude, which is the coolest thing, because like he's not a cult leader, but that's really neat. <laughs> but like he found a way to create a community for a crowd that had nowhere else to go, which is awesome. And the same thing happens with Jehovah's Witnesses too, because it's even smaller and lesser known, and they all know this one guy, Lloyd Evans. It's the weirdest thing. But they're like, yes, I read Lloyd religiously, basically. And what does Lloyd do? He is a former Jehovah's Witness who reads the stuff the church leaders put out every month and reports back on it. Like, here's the crazy stuff they said this month. Here it is. And some of that stuff is like, you shouldn't go to college. You should just devote yourself to Jehovah. And you're like, oh my god. But the only way I find out about what's happening in the Jehovah's world is following this guy. And again, he created this community of people that has nowhere else to go. As atheists, I know we're like a bigger crowd than those groups, but how many atheist people are really putting together communities where you know everybody in it and you can get resources and you get help for everything you need? We do that kind of makeshift, like if you need this, you can talk to this person, you talk to someone else, but we don't kind of have that big community sense 
that churches have. And that's, that's sad. Like, if we're sick, if I'm sick at home, who's bringing me chicken soup? Who's bringing that to me? I better have friends. <laughs> like, but it's not the atheist community. Um, <laughs> if I, I'm having a baby in November, you know who's going to babysit for that baby? Like, maybe my parents, I hope. Like, but it's not like atheists are coming over to take care of the baby, which probably is for the best, because they would eat it. <laughs> but I'll tell you this. If you lost your job, and you're part of a Christian megachurch, they will take care of you. They will make sure that everyone in the church knows, hey, this guy has these skills. If you know, if you're hiring, or you know someone who's hiring, this guy is fantastic. She's fantastic. You should hire these people because they're good people and they have that network all set up. It's awesome. Like, no wonder they want to be part of that community. So again, realize this. When we're telling people, leave religion, leave your church, you're telling them, leave your social safety net. And we have nothing to replace that with. Not, nothing concrete, nothing as stable as they have. And that's a hard thing to do. <laughs> okay, here's another one. Um, Church pastors are really good at telling just great stories. I have been to more churches than I want to tell you about. And the bigger churches, the reason they're big is because their pastors are really compelling speakers, in part. They draw in really good, good people. And I'll give you an example of one thing I heard. I, I said this to someone yesterday. I went to a church and they opened up with the pastor looking at a table and there was like a car jack on it. And he just looks at his, his congregation and he's like, that's a car jack, which by the way, like half of you don't even know. And he's like, if your car, if you've got a flat tire, how many of you know how to use that car jack to, to fix your car? And like a few hands go up and like everyone else is like, uh, no, I have no idea how to use that. And he's like, oh, next to it is a fire extinguisher. If this place caught on fire, how many of you actually know how to use that thing to save us without having to read the instructions first? And again, very few hands went up. And then he's like, you have these great tools, but if we don't know how to use them, they're useless. Let me tell you about the Bible. <laughs> you see where he's going with that. But it's like, oh, that was smart. That was really good. <laughs> and here's the thing. like. I, I don't see this that often in the atheist world. We don't tell good stories. I can rattle off a list of why God doesn't exist, but it's really hard for me to connect with, like, it's hard for me from what I've seen for atheists to connect with people on a more emotional level. And I kind of understand that. We don't really do emotion. <laughs> we try to stick to logic and reason. Um, but you know what? We are, you're humans. You have to be emotional. You have to connect with people where it matters. Um, I'll give you another example of this. I've done several fundraisers over the years um, on my website. And the most successful one I've done is for this girl, Jessica Alquist, who filed a church-state separation lawsuit because her school was promoting religion. And she was bullied and harassed like you wouldn't believe after the judge said, she's right and the school's wrong. She got harassed like crazy. And this is like Twitter, Facebook era, and she's a young woman. So she's getting death threats and rape threats and just horrible, horrible stuff. Um, and people wanted to help her because she did the right thing. She filed this lawsuit. She was the plaintiff. They wanted to help her out. And we raised a ton of money for her. And that's awesome. And then like down the line somewhere, uh, I was talking about Foundation Beyond Belief, we actually sent kind of a secular mission trip overseas. They traveled and did amazing local works. They were helping the local communities. They were doing these great things to help out. And at one point, they said, we're in this area right now that doesn't have a bathroom. We need to build a latrine for these people that is a little more sanitary than the one they're using. And so they're, and how much was it? I don't know, a few hundred dollars to, to get all the equipment they needed to build it. So they had a fundraiser. We couldn't reach the amount. <laughs> Again, how sad is that? Like, that's awesome that people will chip in for Jessica. But come on, a bathroom for people? We couldn't do it? I, I think I have a reason, though, why that happened. And I think the reason was in how we marketed that, how we pitched that idea. It's easy to put a face to the case. Like, this is Jessica. She's awesome. You should chip into her. We just said, this is a latrine. If I said, this is little Bobby, he can't shit anywhere. <laughs> We probably could have raised that money. But this is the thing. The storytelling matters. There, um, 
I, I'm so sorry, the name is escaping me right now, but there's a wonderful activist, uh, maybe it's Sakibu, uh, Sakibu Hutchinson, who does this like um, scholarship, first in the family scholarship. She's awarding scholarships to people who are activists, humanists, atheists, who are the first in their family to go to college. Awesome, that is such a cool idea. And I know, I think she's had some trouble raising the funds for the scholarship sometimes. I think Freedom From Religion Foundation pitched in a grant, which is awesome. But she's been having trouble raising scholarships. And I think what I would, I would say is like, we kind of need these names. Like this is an awesome student who has so much promise and you should want to help this person out. And I think we would do better raising money for that uh, if we could do that. But we're bad, we don't tell those stories. Because how many uh, speeches have you heard that are talking about like science and arguments and logic? And believe me, those have a place, we need those things. But compare that to how many stories you've heard about individuals. And if any of you have listened to, uh, I forgot if Vicki Garrison has spoken yet, um, but if you, or Rebecca Vitzman, like if you hear their stories, they're compelling as hell and you wanna listen to them. Those carry much more weight outside of our bubble. And we need to rely on those stories to kind of communicate our ideas. Um, you know who's good at that, by the way? Neil deGrasse Tyson is really good at that. Carl Sagan was really good at that. <laughs> at telling those stories. Like, that's what we need to emulate. And one last thing for this point, which is I was driving on this road trip. I was in the car for several hours. And I heard about this podcast called Hardcore History. If anyone has heard this. Okay, here's what I knew about hardcore history. It has the word history in its name, so I don't like it. <laughs> and this guy did six episodes about World War I. I'm bored. And each episode was like four hours long. I'm like, oh my God, why would anyone listen? And it took him, by the way, like two and a half years to put out those six episodes, because they're four hours long. Like, why would anyone listen to this? This sounds like torture. I hated history in high school. And then I'm just, I heard so many people raving about this podcast and I couldn't understand it. And I start listening to the first episode of that series. Four hours, I was hooked. Oh my God, my wife, who doesn't care about any of this stuff that I do, was like, and she was like, why are we listening to a history podcast? We're listening and she's like, keep driving. <laughs> I want to finish these three hours or four hours. Like that guy has a way of taking really boring, dry material and just putting a face to the stories and telling these stories. And there is value to that. Churches are really good at telling these stories and getting you to listen. We need to do better at that. Um, okay, number four. I only have five. Four, churches are really good at dying, which sounds bad, but it, they're really good at talking about death. And this is one of those existential questions we all have, right? Like, why are we here? What's our purpose? Where are we going to go after we die? We all know the answers the church offers to those questions. And then we try to makeshift a happy answer to those questions. Like, where are you going to go when you die? You'll go back to where you were before you were born. Or the Richard Dawkins, like, you're lucky to be alive because that's inspiring and that's wonderful and then you will die. Like it's not a very optimistic story, even if it might be inspirational. Um, but this is another reason Christians go to church. They have these inspirational things. They get good ways of thinking about this stuff. Now, it's wrong. It's not true. They're selling you this lie and they offer this false hope. I don't wanna do that. I, I wanna offer some honesty, but honesty doesn't always make us feel better. So how do we overcome that? How do we talk about death so that people will actually listen um, I, I did this interview, uh, I posted last week with this ch humanist chaplain, Mark Campolo. His dad's a famous evangelical preacher. He comes from that lineage of like evangelical preachers who are prominent and have big churches. He knows how to talk about this stuff. So he's a humanist now, left the church. He kind of, uh, he works in Southern California. And what, that was one of the questions I had for him. Like what, what do college students come talk to you about? And he said death. That's what they all want to talk to him about. Because maybe they lost a loved one, maybe they lost a parent, maybe they lost a boyfriend or girlfriend. And in some cases, he said the hardest ones are when some of these people lose a child. How do you talk to an atheist about losing a child? Like there's no, God, this is not part of God's plan, you can't say that. And his challenge was how do you make them not feel like this is the worst possible thing in the world when it is the worst possible thing in the world? And the way he was talking about it, he's just like, 
every time he talks to these parents, he's like, how much did that child, who was maybe alive for a few days, how much did that baby influence you and change your life? And every parent's like, uh, totally changed everything. I mean, I found a way to love that I have never done before to this kid who is not here anymore. And he's like, would you rather that child not have been, would you rather not be pregnant? Would you rather never have gone through this experience? And none of them agree with that. They're all like, no, I would have totally gone through the same thing again for those hours or those days. And as he's talking about all this, and this is stuff I have fortunately not had to deal with, I'm just, I'm not an emotional guy, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm like tearing up. And I'm like, this is amazing that you can talk about this, because I know too many atheists who are just, they, we could not do that. I can't do that with somebody. And this is amazing. And by the way, he was having trouble getting funding for his chaplaincy, so he probably couldn't even be around anymore to help these people with the questions. So where are they going to go, by the way, when they have to talk to this, talk about this with somebody? Who are they going to go to? The religious chaplains. Of course they are, because they can talk about this stuff, and we're not as good at, at it. Um, I will give you this one example that I read online. I didn't write this. I'm not taking credit for it. But it was a way of talking about how do you cope with death, the loss of a loved one, when you're not religious, and you don't want any of the, the God, the heaven, the, the whole George Carlin bit about what happens when you die. You don't want any of that. How do you deal with it? And I, I just want to read this to you, because it's just awesome, the way they phrase it. Um, the death of a loved one is like a shipwreck, and you feel like you're drowning. You have no choice but to float, even though you're just surrounded by the wreckage, the remains of this beautiful ship. You might see a piece of what's left floating by you, and you latch onto it, like a memory or an artifact, or maybe even another person you were connected to by the person you lost. But you have to float. You will latch onto anything. And then the waves come, and they're huge, and they crash over you, and they show no mercy. And the waves never stop, but they do become less frequent. And when they come, it still sucks. It's still awful. You can't escape them. But between them, you keep floating. You keep breathing. It gets a little better between the waves. You still don't know when they're coming, but you figure out how to function in the meantime. And eventually, the waves get smaller, and they're more spaced out. And you know when they're going to come. Birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. You can brace yourself for them. And they never stop coming. But maybe that's not a bad thing, because they're a reminder of that ship. That's, that's beautiful. And no mention of heaven, no mention of God. I have read a lot of books about atheism. Very few of them talk about how to deal with death or how to think about it in a secular way. And churches do that better than anybody. And we are ceding the ground to them if we don't learn how to do that. So let me leave you the last one, a slightly more upbeat one. Churches are just really good at outreach. They're really good at outreach. So whenever there's a new medium, a new technology, there's like two groups who know how to use it really well. Uh, the people who do porn <laughs> and Christians. <laughs> that may be the only way they overlap, possibly. <laughs> But here's the thing, Christians have amazing messengers. They have amazing messengers and the worst message. And you're, like, you're all sinners unless you believe in nonsense. Like you need a good salesperson to sell you that one. <laughs> Meanwhile, we have an awesome message that is based in reality. And a lot of our messengers make me cringe a lot. <laughs> like, we need to do better. If you don't believe me, go to YouTube and type in atheist, and you'll, you'll see what I mean. Like, we will mock you for not believing the same way we believe, and then we wonder why we're ineffective. Um, so I've been writing this website, Friendly Atheist, for like eight years now. And I'll tell you the story about how this YouTube channel got started. A couple years ago, this filmmaker, a guy who teaches like modern technology at a college, he said, I'd like to make a documentary about young atheists. So can I just pick your brain for a bit and talk to you and get a sense of all this? And so we did. We met up. We talked about you know, what the trends are and what's happening. He's like, interesting. Can I just get you on camera saying some of these things again? And that, that's it. I'll softball some questions your way. You know, How should atheists come out to their parents? Should they? Things like that. So we did that. We filmed it in my house. He, he had all the equipment. It was really cool. And he filmed, and then I didn't know what he was going to do with it. You never really know how the, it's preliminary, you know? And what happened is, he just took those chunks 
of, here's a question and my answer, and he just slapped him online. He put him on YouTube, he called it the atheist voice because why, whatever, who cares, it's just a word, like no one's going to watch. We just slapped him online, and here's the weird thing that I didn't see coming. Without any publicity or anything, people started watching those videos. And I'm like, how the hell did they find out about those videos even being there? It's because a lot of young people use YouTube as Google. So, you know, if I have a question like, should I come out to my parents as an atheist, I might go to Google and type that in and see what comes up. Most high schoolers, they're going to YouTube to do that. And they were coming across these videos, and the response was really interesting, because it turns out there weren't a lot of videos like that on YouTube, where someone just offered a straight explanation of, well, here's what you should do. And then we realized people are watching, we're like, well, how come, uh, let's ask some more questions, you know? Uh, how should, uh, how should atheists deal with politics? What should we think about this stuff? I don't know. But we, we started making these. Then we started getting more creative. Like, what are things you should never say to an atheist? What are things, uh, what are questions Christians should ask themselves? For example, if you really want to make a Christian squirm, you could ask them, is Anne Frank burning in hell right now? They get really awkward when you ask that question. <laughs> but, but what's really cool is, I've spoken at a lot of colleges, and when I speak at colleges, nobody seems to know anything I write about on my website. I spend 99% of my time on Friendly Atheist, like the website, no one reads it when they're in college. But they all know the YouTube channel. And this is something that I didn't realize until I started doing it, but I promise you Christians know it really well. They know people aren't coming to church, so they're going to go where the kids are to reach out to them. And right now it's YouTube. And maybe in a year or two it won't be. It'll be something else. But we've got to figure out where people are trying to search for these questions and then be there. Like, we can't rely on Google to send people to our meetup group. We can't rely on, you know, a certain website to, to generate all that interest. We've got to figure out where people are going. So, like, high schoolers, if you look at a list of, like, high school, the celebrities that high schoolers look up to, you have never heard of most of them. Like, I've read articles in newspapers about these big celebrities, and I'm like, nope, nope, no idea. They're not from the Disney Channel, which is probably where, like, my generation had celebrities. They're not from there. They're just people who are popular on YouTube. How many of you have not heard of PewDiePie? Number, most popular person in the world on YouTube. I promise you everyone under, like, 15 has heard of that guy. But that's the thing. We have to go where people are. And I realized that no one's going to read my blog after a while, but I need to transition to YouTube. And that's kind of what I've been trying to do. Um, but here's the thing. We've got to figure out how to communicate with people where they're at and beat them to it. So if people are using Vine, how many of us use Vine to communicate questions in six seconds? How many of you are using Instagram to promote ideas of some sort? I don't even know how you would do some of this stuff, but Christians are thinking about it. So, you know, if you're, especially if you're in college, if you're in high school right now, you know what the technology is. You know what your friends are reading, what they're looking at, and figure out how to communicate these ideas to that generation, because it's going to change. No one's, I promise you, people are not reading these books anymore. They're not. They're getting their information from other places. So, anyway. After all this, I'm not saying we should copy the church. There's so much churches do that are rightly wrong. Like, they're despicable. We don't want to copy everything they do. But there are some things they do really, really well. And I think if we could figure out what that is, if we could do some of these things a little better, we have a better chance of reaching those people who are on the fence right now who probably don't believe in God, but they're probably going to take their kids to Sunday school because they don't know where else to teach them about ethics and things like that. Or they'll go to church because it's what you're supposed to do if you're a nice person. Like, we don't want them there. You're already, you did the hard work. You don't believe in this stuff anymore. But they have no reason to be part of our groups. We need to figure out a way to fix that. So I'll leave it at that. If you have any questions, I'd like to answer them. Thank you. Yeah. Not too long ago, I was doing something, I guess, similar to what you did, where I visited churches just to see... What, I'll repeat the question, by the way. Yeah, just to see what was going on. Uh, and I was kind of shocked. They actually had uh, 
oil changes for free. They'd get together some of these mini The church had oil changes for free for yeah. people visiting. But I, I would ask people that kind of a question. What is it you like about the church atmosphere here compared to there, there, or there? Yeah. And almost all of them said the fun of community activity as well as uh, cheap daycare. Yeah. Oh my goodness, cheap daycare is a huge... So yeah, churches offer these... You can, if you're part of a big evangelical church, for example, you could go there Sunday morning for a sermon. You could go there midweek for another sort of youth activity. You could go there to study. You could go there for your cafe, your bookstore. You could drop your kids off the entire time while you're there. And you have all these activities you could be a part of. You could get a job there if you wanted to. You know what I mean? They have it all covered. So yeah, and then it's like, you know, Come to my local group. We're going to talk about religion for a while. It, it doesn't compare. And of course, like, how could you say no to that? And again, atheist groups have made some strides in that event. Like, so a lot of conferences now, they will offer free child care. You know, if you bring your kid, we have trained professionals who will look after them so you can enjoy the conference and not have to worry. And so you can come. Because otherwise, it's such a crazy hassle. You can't leave your kid at home and then come here or something. So we're doing better, but we don't have that level that they do. But yeah, it's, it's amazing what they will do. And by the way, it's not just at the church. There will sometimes be Christians who will be at a gas station. Can I pay for your gas today? And while they're pumping your gas, let me tell you about Jesus. Man, that's good. That is sneaky as hell. <laughs> I don't know how to replicate that, but man, that is, that's like... I'm impressed by their cleverness there. But yeah. Yes? You mentioned the quote from Sanderson Jones. Of the yeah. California Assembly and with the rock and the shoe, with the rock representing God. Now, but here's the thing. Is it really enough just to eliminate the God and the supernatural? Obviously, you look at the church world, you see a lot of other problems. You've got tribalism. You've got uh, hero worship. You have groupthink. You have um, all these other negatives that also come along with the church. Those are not necessarily tied to God. Or the right. supernatural, and you know everybody is susceptible to right. these phenomena. So how do you prevent that? What else needs to be cut out? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is basically, you know, churches have a lot of problems. They have the the pastor worship sort of thing, the hero worship. There's a lot of things that are wrong with church. So how do we fix that? I mean, part of it is the transparency. Part of it is making clear what certain expectations are across the board. And yeah, anytime some people get a lot of power things will get crazy. I'm not saying we can avoid all those things. That is going to be hard to do, especially because in a lot of big communities, you need those leaders. And you know, just that power divide can mess people up in certain ways. We can't avoid all the pitfalls that come with a big group and a big community. But if we're aware of what some of these problems are, and we kind of see it happening, I'm hopeful that like a crowd like this that is more critical and self-aware of what we're doing could try to see it happening and try to do whatever it takes to prevent it in the future. But again, you're right. It could happen within our communities as well. I'm not, it probably has in some ways too. Um, but hopefully, I think we would do a better job than the church has done in trying to fix some of these things. I don't know. Let me go somewhere else. Where's another question? Right here. Right here. You go over there and I'll come here. Yes. Congratulations. They're what? So how can we do that? Right. So the question is basically, you know, church groups, Catholic groups, they're really good at connecting with you on social media. If you follow them on Twitter, yeah, they will probably follow you back. And they'll probably make sure, like, they'll call you later. They're going to get in touch with you to talk to you in person, too. Um, and there are atheist groups that will do that 
Um, I mean, if you talk outside to uh, Sarah Moorhead, who does the Recovering from Religion and the Hotline Project, so you could talk to someone who's an atheist in person, like o over the phone. You could talk to them about your concerns. Um, I'm not saying we don't do that at all, but this is the thing, and this is what I would hope, especially if you're a teenager or something, you know these mediums better than, than most of us do. Man, I'm not even old, and I'm not good at a lot of these mediums. But that's the thing. You know these mediums. You know how people connect with each other. And if you want to be an activist or something, it's like, well, what are people looking for on Twitter? If someone came up to you and said on Twitter something like, I don't believe in God, but I, I know you, and I saw like in your profile it said you're an atheist, can I talk to you about it? What are you going to do in response? And is there a way to, to mass produce that sort of thing so that everyone can talk to somebody, get their questions answered? I'm not saying I have the answers to all that, but this is something that churches know they have to do for their own survival. Like, if you're interested in what they have to say, they're going to follow up with you repeatedly. And we have to figure out how to do that. And that's why I'm, like, I'm really hopeful that like, younger people who, can, who are more adept at using a lot of this stuff They'll figure out how to use it in ways that I can't even fathom right now. So, but it's really important what you're saying. So I, I hope I hope people will figure that out. Along the way. Yes. Um, I was just going to say you made a really good point about atheists and freethinkers not being able to express themselves and tell their stories, and we realized that in our group in Little Rock, and so we started our own Toastmasters group called Free Speakers. <laughs> And we noticed that when we looked around the United States, there's about six uh, groups that are free thinkers or atheist groups that have started their own. But you can also just join one that's already there. Like a Toastmasters. Yes, you can, yeah. you can join a group that's already there, and you have uh, people that are a captive audience. They can't tell you what to speak about, and you can right. practice your <laughs> speeches on them. <laughs> so the thought is uh, trying to tell your own story. All of us know Christians. Every time they tell their born-again story, they all have their personal story of how they came to Jesus. What is your come to Jesus or get the hell away from Jesus story? <laughs> and yeah, Toastmasters or anywhere where you could practice telling that story, um, that's powerful. And by the way, there are, there are a lot of books that seem to be coming out like now that are personal stories of how people left the faith. And they weren't just pastors. Like I, I'm used to seeing books written by like pastors who left the fold, but now they're just more personal. They're just... I was religious, or I was in this fundamentalist sect, and I left it. And I'm telling you, if, if I had to figure out in my head, like, I don't know, uh, some book with here's what's wrong with the Bible versus that compelling story, I think this one will sway more people over time because you can connect with that. And right. yeah, any way that we could share those stories, and if we can get better at that, it's a powerful tool that we need to figure out how to use. All right, let's go to for a Hemet Meta.